Hi, gang. I'm, uh, I'm Rand Fishkin. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of SparkToro. And it's really exciting to be here and chat about web marketing today. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> I mean, it is, uh, I will say, it's unusual. I, I do a lot of uh, teaching about web marketing, but I don't know that I have ever uh, tried to do it with, with folks like yourself. It is, um, so this is gonna be a new and unique and challenging experience for me, but hopefully hopefully fun for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. I'll try and involve Dungeons and Dragons and pasta and um, possibly, you know, some uh, friends of mine and pictures of my wife, Geraldine. It'll, it'll be, we'll, we'll do the best we can. <laughs> so, all right, to start with, uh, so I have a bunch of slides I'm going to go through, but then at the end of the slides, what I'm hoping is that we will all, like the three of us, uh, Daisy and Eli, you, you two and I will all try and like do some marketing ourselves. Just come up with some ideas for doing marketing uh, for some, some campaign or some products that we, we think are interesting. So marketing is essentially communicating with people one-to-one -one or one-to-many uh, on the internet trying to build an audience of people who pay attention to you and then persuade them to do things, all sorts of things. Well, marketing is, is very, very broad, but um, <laughs> one, one question I think that I get almost always, I, I, I don't know if you have this experience as well, but from uh, engineers, software engineers, computer engineers, um, you know, smart and savvy people, but they, they ask this question about like, do we really need marketing? Wouldn't the world be better off if there was no marketing? I'm not so sure about that. Um, I, think, I think maybe if, if you live in a world where you need to communicate things to large numbers of people and have them believe those things and take action based on them, you need marketing of some kind. So that could be selling products or sharing ideas or spreading information, all those things require marketing. I'll, 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 let's go through some examples, right? So right now um, we are having this conversation, not in person because of course uh, it's a pandemic and we're dealing with this coronavirus and, and people who care about the health of other people want to convince everyone they possibly can to wear masks, right? You, You've seen, I'm sure you and your parents have talked about it, right? Like, that like, you know, in places like South Korea and Japan and even uh, Italy and Spain and Sweden, places that had terrible, terrible outbreaks initially have managed to control the virus because people wore masks, right? So the, the governments and the health officials and, and media and newspapers and people that people pay attention to managed to convince all these people in all these countries that wearing a mask would help protect them and help protect other people around them. And thus, they get to go to restaurants and, and, and we don't because we have not yet been successful with our marketing here in the United States. Um, and that's, uh, that's frustrating. But hopefully, we'll get better at marketing and then we'll do a better job convincing people to wear masks. Something that has been pretty effective here in the United States uh, is the Black Lives Matter movement, right? That's a movement that um, you know, I know, I know your, your, your mom and dad a little bit and, 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 uh, Geraldine and I talked with them about how like, oh, they you know, talked to you about this, about, um, Black Lives Matter and how it, just a couple of years ago, even like five years ago, right? When it first started after, after Ferguson, uh, not a lot of American citizens supported the Black Lives Matter movement, but as of the last three months, most Americans do, and that's remarkable, right? The, the movement and the people involved with it across a wide range of, of society have uh, shown people what racial injustice looks like, and they've managed to change some people's, a lot of people's behaviors and attitudes uh, towards racial injustice. And that's, that's a powerful thing, right? It's not, it's not quite selling a product. I don't think we always think of it as marketing, but it, it really is marketing in a lot of ways. And then of course, there's a local Seattle company, Wizards of the Coast, who makes Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and they have they've obviously had, had a lot of success, especially the last 10 years, uh, attracting more people to the game, and more people to buy their books and, and digital products and 
you know, little miniatures. This is actually a little Lego miniature, but we'll pretend for the, <laughs> for the sake. Uh, and, uh, and, th and that's been awesome, right? I, um, I have gotten to play. I know that the two of you have gotten to play. It's so a lot. fun, and the more people that get involved with it, right, the more, the more it spreads, the more fun people can have. So that's awesome, too. And then I don't know if, uh, if you have not yet tried this pasta, I'll send you some, but this is Benedetto Cavalieri, and they make amazing pasta, absolutely amazing pasta. It's frustratingly hard to find, right? But, but if, you, if you work on marketing for them, they want people to have better pasta, not just the stuff you can buy at the supermarket, but this really, really great pasta. And uh, there's you know, marketers in Italy who are trying to make sure that there's better distribution of it and that people know about it and, and not many people do yet, but selling pasta, that's another, that's another form of marketing. Is it actually like really good pasta or is oh. it just pretty good pasta? Oh my God. Eli, so you know how when you bite into pasta and it's sort of like, it's not quite, it doesn't have the right texture versus it has exactly the right texture. Like it's thick enough and it just, the sauce sticks to it nicely. This, this is the stuff. This is like magical. You have to be pretty picky about your pasta to like, to care as much as I do, but I'm telling you, I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm kind of a pasta addict. So, uh, yeah. All right. So how do, how do these uh, companies and organizations and people, how do they do marketing? And the process roughly, we're, we're going to skip a whole bunch of steps and I'm sure sophisticated marketers who watch this will go, well, what about, but we're, we're going to go through just the basics. And the basics are they try and figure out who is the audience that they want to reach. Right. So for people who buy pasta, that might be people like me who are crazy about pasta and love it. Uh, for players of Dungeons and Dragons, right, it might be a different group. For Black Lives Matter, it might be another different group. For uh, people who are trying, right, for health officials who are trying to convince people to wear masks, it's pretty much every human being on the planet, right? Is what yeah. uh, and then they want to gain a deep understanding of that audience. Right, we we want to know as much as we possibly can about not just who they are, but their behaviors and how they think about the problem that our our product or our organization solves. Uh, they want to know more about us as individuals and as a group. And then they try and figure out what messages are going to resonate. Right, so um, we talked about wearing masks. Right, what works in. Uh, Japan and South Korea might not be the same thing that works in Canada or the United States or Mexico to try and convince people to wear masks. And so different marketers, right, and different people have to figure out what is the message that's going to get people on board with the thing that I am trying to convince them to do. And then, and then my grandfather's going to interrupt us by calling, but we are going to yeah, we can, we can go past this. <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll go back to, uh, and after we figure out what messages resonate with people, then we have to figure out effective channels and tactics. And by channels, I don't just mean like television channels. I mean, um, do we try and reach people on places like Facebook or Instagram? Do we try and reach them through a Google search? Do we try and reach them with a billboard on the highway? Do we try to reach them on their favorite TV show or radio show? Do we try and get our product featured in a Disney movie? Um, I'm trying to remember, I was, watching, I was watching one of the Marvel movies recently and oh, and they had like, oh, they were, they were featuring, I doubt someone paid for it, but they were featuring like a shawarma dealer. Do you remember this? Like Iron Man goes and talks to a shawarma dealer and, and gets, shawarma takeout. I don't think that like the shawarma, um, you know, lobbyists of, <laughs> or marketers convinced Marvel to put that in the movie. I think that was just a, uh, a fluke, but that kind of thing, right? They, they try and find channels and tactics to go reach these people. And then there's an experimentation process. Marketing is always experimenting. Like nothing, nothing works consistently. There's no like, well, if we just keep doing this one thing exactly the same for 50 years, we'll always be successful. 
that is not Except how marketing for market works. is yeah, the one gotta, that always works well depending yeah. on your product that usually works is market <laughs> is that, but, otherwise it'll never work <laughs> fair it'll enough usually work yep yep uh, so, right, so we're trying to like learn what works and what doesn't, improve and repeat. And as people have different experiences, this, this is one of the, the, the frustrating challenges, right, of, of marketing is that as people have different experiences and they're exposed to different things, as new competition enters the market, new information, right, people uh, learn more about coronavirus or they learn more about Dungeons and Dragons, that, that will change their mind about how they perceive those things and then different kinds of marketing will work better or worse. So let's, let's go through these, these just few steps uh, with some examples. We have to know who are the right people for our message, right? If we wanna do marketing to them. And a big, a big part of that is, is kind of asking the question of what do these right people, what kinds of attributes do they have, right? So if I am, for example, uh, selling, pasta or Dungeons and Dragons or mask wearing or Black Lives Matter, these four people pictured here are very, very good targets for all of those things, right? But then, then we wanna know, these are, by the way, this is uh, Geraldine, my wife and myself um, and Adam and Dan, some friends of ours, and, uh, and we're all sharing dinner together. In fact, we're sharing dinner before we are about to play Dungeons and Dragons. So, you know, uh, and we probably <laughs> most nights had pasta, I don't know, whatever it is, right? So we, we <laughs> to figure out whether this audience, right, these people are right for our marketing, marketers usually kind of um, carve things out into these three buckets. They, they have these, these three things that they uh, put everything into. They're, Demographics, it's a word that basically means things like uh, uh, characteristic descriptions of people based on, on attributes that they have. Things like uh, how much money does their family make and where do they live and how much education they have. Did they go to high school? Did they go to college? Did they get an advanced degree? Uh, how old are they? Uh, how big is their family, right? Gerald, Geraldine and I, it's just the two of us. Uh, I think Adam has two kids, two kids maybe. Uh, gender, right? Uh, male, female, non-binary, um, all those kinds of things are fit into demographics. And then there's something called psychographics, which is uh, things like lifestyle, right? What sorts of things do they uh, do? What values do they hold? Values like, um, you know, uh, that, that could be political values, it could be social values, uh, it could be things that they value in their life, right? It could be interests, so interests, games, right? Um, I know that, that your family is big into games, our family's pretty big into games. I'm a big fan of television and fiction and writing. Um, could be attitudes around things and, and personality traits, like open to new experiences or I don't like new experiences at all. Or a personality trait could be, um, I'm very, very outgoing, or I'm very shy and reserved, right? And different, different products, different marketers can appeal to different sets and, and uh, groups of these. And then there's behavioral stuff. So things like, behavioral would be like, uh, what do you, when you go to Google, what do you search for? Especially in this particular thing, right? So if you're, if you're making pasta, for example, well, you want to see like, hey, could uh, are people searching for, I don't know, the best pasta from Italy or the best pasta recipes and maybe we could go pitch them, right? Uh, are people using Instagram or Twitter or Facebook to solve this problem? Are they listening to, I don't know, a podcast or, um, you know, or, or a, a, a webinar or someone uh, like what we're doing now? In addition to those, right, once we, once we solve the, okay, this is, this is the who our audience is, right? We've decided, all right, these four people are, are who we're going after and people like them. Uh, we want to know how do we better understand the audience. Like we want to know things about them, right? Not, not just attributes. And a lot of times marketers, in order to do this, will ask a relatively large group of people, hopefully a large group of people, um, that are potential right customers, whatever, pasta buyers or D&D &D players or, or, or um, 
you know, citizens of a country that is not responsibly wearing masks yet, they'll ask them the same questions to try and get statistically valid answers. So statistically valid just means like a large enough group that if you get um, whatever, 40% of them saying this, if you were to ask a way, way larger group, you would still get around 40% saying the same, right? So it's representative. If someone were to survey the three of us, that wouldn't necessarily be representative of people who, uh, let's say, live in Washington State. But if we were to ask 10,000 people who live in Washington State something, that would be pretty representative of what Washington State, uh, people in Washington State are, are like, right? So marketers like to do this. They like to ask these surveys and then they produce data like this, right? Graphs that say, oh yeah, here's what best describes my work or here's how I do these tasks. Um, here's what I like about pasta and don't like, right? Maybe, maybe some people like it al dente, maybe some people like it soft and squishy. Those people are Philistines, you should never associate yourself with them. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, no, I look, uh, if you're, I don't, know if, uh, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but uh, Geraldine's whole family, of course they're Italian, right? And so they have like a competition to see who can make the pasta more crunchy or closest to crunchy while still being edible. Um, but you, you get these answers to the questions so that, so that you can better understand your audience's behaviors broadly, right? And then I like to do, not all marketers do this, but I really like to go, these are, these are some of the customers for my company. Um, it's a company called 97th Floor. They have, they're, they're based in uh, Utah and California and all over the place. But back when you were allowed to travel, right, back before the pandemic, uh, I like to go to conferences and events and people's offices and like just interview them, right? Sit down with them and talk to them about, hey, what, uh, you know, what, how do you solve this problem? What do you use to do it right now? Uh, what, what's compelling about whatever you're using right now? What's missing from it, right? And you just have those conversations both to better understand people and sort of add some, um, I would say some color and some depth to the data that you get back from surveys, but also so you can have relationships. I really love as a marketer being able to call someone up, right? Or, or send them an email and say, hey, does this, does this sound like it would work to you? Does this make sense to you? I find that super, super valuable. You can see um, Wizards of the Coast, for example, does this. I don't know if you've ever seen one of their, but they do like big surveys and they do, uh, about whether people are having fun playing a particular kind of character or whether uh, people like a new option that they've given to people or if they like a new adventure module or if they like a setting or whatever it is, right? And, uh, and then they also have like whole big groups of people that, they're, that their marketing teams get, gets on the phone with and they talk to them about playing the game and they watch people playing the game. Um, when Geraldine used to work at Cranium, the board game company, they had a room and the room had like, it had a wall that looked like a mirror, but you could see in on one side, right? So it was a mirror from the inside, but then it's a window on the other. And they would watch people, they would invite families to come and play the board game. And then they would watch them. They would watch them and they'd see what they had fun with and what they didn't have fun with and what they argued about and which rules didn't make sense, right? All that kind of stuff so they could do better marketing and, and better make a better product too. Um, <laughs> if other people are already trying to reach the customers with similar messages, right? The people you're trying to reach, you can, you can look at what's worked in the past, right? You can look at what's working for your competition, right? So it could be, hey, this pasta seller is really good at selling pasta to Americans. What, what makes them so good at it, right? You can ask questions like that. Okay, how do we figure out which messages are gonna resonate, right? What's gonna, what's gonna convince people to do the thing, to wear the mask, to support Black Lives Matter, to play Dungeons and Dragons, to buy pasta? Well, one thing you can do is try and figure out what has worked for others in the past. So, for example, the people at Wizards of the Coast saw that, um, I don't know if you, have you ever seen this show? It's kind of scary. Geraldine thought it was really scary. It's called Stranger Things. 
No, we haven't seen it. Haven't seen it. Yeah. I personally, I find it a little bit spooky. It's supposed to be for, a, you know, kind of uh, ages between, I would say, yours and mine, but... I've heard, I've heard of the show, I think. Yeah, yeah, but so they play Dungeons and Dragons in the show. The kids in the show, like, they're the central characters, and they play D&D &D throughout all the, um, all, I think there's three seasons or something on Netflix, and when the show came out, this was a, a good few years ago, I didn't watch the show until this year, but... Um, when the show came out, D&D &D saw that a ton of people watched the show and then started playing Dunge Dungeons and Dragons, right? Then they went out and bought the books and invited their friends. And so the, the people who do marketing for D&D &D thought, oh man, this is, this is amazing. Like this is working really well. I want, can we get other television shows and movies and film and like, right, popular culture people to play Dungeons and Dragons and could we get them to do it publicly? And so since then, you know, the D&D &D people have, have set up like whole, whatever, video casts and, and podcasts where relatively famous people, a lot of actors, um, especially because they do, you know, they're good at voice work, which is fun for characters. Uh, they, this has encouraged many more. They worked, did it again. Um, they look at things like what do the buyer, what do people of the product say, right? Why is it that, what am I, 41 years old? Why is it that adult, uh, you know, older people who, um, you know, have tons of things they could be doing with their You're time? You're glitching out. Can you Why? repeat that? Yeah, can you like? You're oh. glitching out. Sorry. You're here, you play for a I wonder if that is, is that my connection? How's that better? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, it's better right now. Yeah, so, so the D&D folks might reasonably also ask, why do people love our product, right? And so here's a, this is, this is from Reddit, but right, what's your favorite thing about D&D? &D? And they might ask a lot of people who love the product, who play the game, who are really interested, what do you love about it? So that they can take that message and share it with other people, right? If people love this pasta or love this movement or love whatever, not dying of coronavirus, right? Um, I know I personally like that. Uh, then they will, right, they'll, they'll go and try and amplify that message. And I, I really like this one. What's your favorite thing about D&D? &D? And this per first person says, uh, I love having friends that I do stuff with regularly as an adult. That's really sweet, right? And, it, and it's true, like one of the, ma the magical things about D&D, &D, well, before the pandemic, was you'd get together in person. Right? You have friends and you get together in person and you play together and it's, it's wonderful. What about people, and they, they will try and ask this question also to people who sort of almost bought or were almost interested in the product but ended up not buying um, or not, we call it converting, right? Not doing the thing that the marketer wants them to do. And so there's this, there was this great New York Times article that talked about why Dungeons and Dragons has gotten so much more popular and also what's held it back for a long time. One of the big things that's held it back for a long time is many people um, felt, uh, felt like it was too nerdy or dorky or not cool. Like when, uh, when I was your age, for example, I got teased a lot for being interested in Dungeons and Dragons. Like I got teased at school and asked friends to play. They made fun of me. It sucked. Um, I hated it. In fact, that is why I didn't play until I was, what, 39 years old? Because I was ashamed. Like, I thought it was, I thought it was something that was not cool and not okay for me to do. And, and that was obviously not true, right? But one of the things that's been really helpful is the, all the marketing that's been happening around Dungeons and Dragons, you know, people, people like, like you two playing, people uh, in, in families, playing with their families, people who, right, who are famous playing, that makes me feel like it's okay for me, right? That I can, that I can do this thing too. That's, that's awesome, right? That's one of the superpowers of marketing. All right, uh, channels and tactics. So figuring out where to go do marketing, right? We, we, we know who our audience is. We understand them pretty well now. Uh, we, we know what messages might, might resonate with them to help convince them to try our product or to, to do the thing we want them to do. Where do we go do it? And 
frankly, uh, a great way to think about this is to think about how people um, go through the journey of, of buying something or, or of taking an action, right? So a brief story, I'll tell you a brief, brief little story. I was in, this is again, uh, uh, this is last year. I was in Italy with Geraldine and we went to a cooking class, um, which, was, which was really, really fun. And, uh, and I learned to make uh, proper Italian risotto. Do you know what risotto is? Yeah, my mom has a recipe that she makes and it's really good. Yeah, so I am, I am nuts for risotto. I just love it. And when I learned to make it, I was like, oh man, I gotta, when I get home, I gotta, I gotta learn to do this well. Uh, it is very challenging <laughs> to learn how to do well. And, and one of the things that I figured out is in order to make great risotto, you have to take, these are, these are bones, right, beef bones. You take them and you put them in the oven under the broiler and they get all brown and crispy and nice. And then you boil that, those bones in water to, um, to make a stock, right, or a, or a broth. And that's part of what you, you know, put into the rice that gives it so much flavor. And you, the reason you need bones is because you need uh, the, the stuff that comes from the middle of the bones, uh, collagen. The marrow? Yeah, the oh. marrow contains collagen. And that collagen gives this like thick richness to the stock, which then goes into the rice, which then makes it super magical um, and extra tasty. But of course, when faced with the problem, I don't know if you remember, but um, if you went to the grocery store, probably you didn't go to the grocery store because it was like one person going shopping per family. But back in February, March, April, at least w where we live, there were no bones at the grocery store. Like they were just sold out, completely sold out, couldn't get them. So I was like, well, I guess I'll go and buy some, you know, whatever, stock from uh, the shelf. It, it did not work well. Like it just, it wasn't as good. It didn't. It didn't work. And so uh, I ended up searching around the internet, uh, asking a bunch of people, and I found uh, this stock, you can't quite see it that I'm holding in my hand, but it's from this company called uh, Kettle and Fire. And um, I, once I discovered that stuff, I was like, this, this is finally a stock, a commercial stock, right? The one that I can buy in a box that is as good as the one that I make at home, so I can use that for my risotto. Now Geraldine drinks it in the morning sometimes just straight. <laughs> she loves it. Um, but so this is like a what marketers would call the buyer's journey, right? It's like a it's like a, the journey that you take to discover uh, the product or discover the problem. And and the reason it's so important for marketers to understand is because it helps us figure out where and how to do our marketing. Right? We want to do it in all four of these stages, right? So in the discovery stage, right, are people starting by searching for pasta? Are they starting by searching for recipes? Are they starting by searching for a specific kind of recipe? Are they even using Google at all? Or is Google not how they you know, find this, this thing? Are they talking about it on Facebook right, or on, uh, on other social channels? Maybe they are reading news articles. Right? There's a, a Washington Post article here about this. Maybe they're watching videos on YouTube of, I guess it's a beautiful drone shot of, of Italy, which I think all pasta videos usually start with. Uh, or, or maybe they have a trusted source that they already go to. Right? I, well, back when we could go, I would go to De Laurentiis in, in Pike Place Market all the time. Uh, it's an Italian spe specialty store and talk to the people there about you know, what I should buy and how I should make something and which things to get, all that kind of stuff, right? So these are, these are channels where I might want to do market. If I'm, a, if I'm a pasta marketer, I might want to go to De Laurentiis and say, hey, we want you to start carrying our product. I might want to go to uh, YouTube and make videos, right? Or pitch people who already make videos on YouTube about recipes on using our pasta brand in their recipes and talking about it. I might want to do the same thing for news reporters, or I might want to do the same thing on social media. I might try and do um, search engine optimization, right? To try and rank my page in Google, those kinds of things. So there, there's lots of channels and tactics I could pursue. I'm only covering a few. The list could be huge. There's 
thousands of places we could do marketing. Uh, and then once we have this, this cycle ready, we want to experiment, learn, improve, and repeat. So it looks something like this, right? I do a marketing thing. I try and boost that thing's reach, right? So maybe I, uh, I don't know, let's say, let's say I get an article published in the newspaper uh, or, or on a news website about my pasta. Now I'm gonna try and get more people to read that by I don't know, sharing it on social media and sending it to my friends and emailing people I know who have big audiences, trying to get them to talk about it. Then I wanna grow my audience. So people who come to my website, maybe I wanna have an email list. So you know, people enter their email and now I can email them directly. And I try and improve the effectiveness of all these things. Maybe the email list didn't work so well. And so instead I try and build a, I don't know, an Instagram page. Uh, and then I try and get higher returns next time, right? A better result. And of course, this is an experiment experimentation process. So you can, you can change what you do. You change which marketing things you do. Maybe, maybe I stopped doing news stuff because news pieces didn't work well for me. Maybe I change how I engage my audience, right? The email thing didn't work for me. Maybe I change where I do the marketing, right? There's, there's lots and lots of this process. And, and from this, you get, you, know, you get information about what works and what doesn't, and you stop and you try again. Uh, and from it, you hopefully over time get better and better at this process so that you can you know, sell more of, of whatever product it is. Um, one of the, one of the questions I almost always get, I get this from, uh, marketers, no matter how savvy or sophisticated they are, they always ask, okay, I have a new thing. I have a new game. I have a new product. I have a new idea. I have a new, um, problem. Which thing should I do first? And uh, my, my advice on this is is that there are lots and lots of options and I would not encourage you to do everything, right? You could, you could go and you could create a blog. You could go and try and become a, an influencer in your field, right? Someone who lots of people follow and pay attention to. You could try to go to social media like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. You could try building a community on your own website or in, in your own uh, world. You could contribute to other publications. You could invest in YouTube, right? You could participate in events and conferences, right? Maybe you travel around, go to food shows and try and convince people to try your pasta. Which one should you do? I think the best way to do this is to think about three things and choose just one or two of those, which is try and find an area that you personally like, like you are passionate and you're interested. If you don't like Twitter, you're not gonna be great at it. I've never seen, I've never, in the history of marketing, I've never seen anyone say, well, I'm terrible at Instagram, but we do really well there. It, does, it doesn't happen, right? You have, to, you have to personally have some interest. And then you have to have that area also be a place where you can provide value that's unique, right? You do something that nobody else does. And last but not least, you want that area to actually be something your customers or your potential customers pay attention to, right? If you're trying to uh, pitch people on Dungeons and Dragons in, I don't know, a, an online forum about cars, it's, it's not gonna go well, right? That's not, that's not where your customers are. They don't, that's not what they're there for. They wanna learn about which pickup I, truck to drive. There was, uh, there was an old d, &D cartoon uh, and that uh, Daisy and me watched a couple of times, and there was a car commercial that started out with the intro to that thing, and they were, and and the like the person who like gave them all their powers and stuff, okay, uh, got in a Toyota and was like, come on, I'll help you escape, and it was hilarious. But yeah, maybe they could do D and D in car commercials. And and who knows, right? Like I, I say, maybe it, it's not great to be in a car form, but I never would have expected, right, that. Um, you know, a super effective thing would be for Dungeons and Dragons to unintentionally get featured on a Netflix, you know, scary TV show. But it worked, right? It worked, worked super well for them. Well, there you go. Uh, and, and I generally tell folks, I think you should, 
if you possibly can, before you do whatever you're going to do, right? Before you make your product, you know, your new pasta, your new uh, game, your new um, campaign, you, you should try and build a community by doing a few of these marketing things so that when you finally create whatever it is you're going to create and you have something to sell and something to market, there's a whole bunch of people that want to support you, right? Um, if you're familiar with like Kickstarter, right? So uh, there was this game, Robot Turtles. And the wonderful thing about Robot Turtles and Kickstarter was the Robot Turtles game, which was, which the idea was to teach kids how to do programming through games. You played it, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, mm, only played it, sure. Oh, you played it maybe a couple times, right? And the whole, the whole, <laughs> the whole wonderful thing about Kickstarter was the creators of Robot Turtle were able to build this huge community of people who supported the idea of the game before the game ever existed, right? They wanted to be champions for of it. They wanted to do the marketing of that game because they liked the idea before it ever existed. Amazing, right? That, that's, what, that's what I really think is wonderful when you're launching new things with marketing. All right. La last piece before we get yeah, into- Yeah, my dad did a good job on that for Robot Turtles. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, Robot Turtles was a very successful campaign. There probably was some smart people behind it. Uh, who can say? <laughs> um, yeah. I, I encourage a lot of marketers um, and people who think about marketing not to exclusively, I think this happens a lot in the world where, where people think that marketing means advertising. And advertising is one tiny tactic, right? It's one thing you can do in the world of, of marketing. Advertising is essentially paying someone or, or some publication with an audience to uh, show your message, right? So, so classic advertising would be you're watching, I don't know, a sports game on TV uh, and an ad comes up for pasta or Dungeons and Dragons. I don't think Dungeons and Dragons does a whole lot of TV advertising, but... Toyota does a lot of TV advertising, right? Like th their commercials are everywhere. So I worry a lot of the time when people think that they should just throw money at advertising. In the, in the web world, it's usually at Google or Facebook and let them sort all this stuff out. Uh, Facebook and Google do control the vast majority of advertising on the internet. Uh, one of the problems is if you are you know, scrolling through whatever. I'm, I'm scrolling through my phone. I'm looking at, at, at Twitter or Instagram or Google or whatever it is. And I see an ad like this. I don't know who Green Chef is. Now, I can probably get a, like a rough idea from this, but I don't know. Do I, is $40 off a good deal? How much do they normally cost? Is that, are those like $100 salads? It seems seems weird. Like, I, I don't know what this deal is. I oh, haven't heard of the company. Yeah, they clearly are expensive salads. Yeah, right? Like, the, they look like fancy salads. But, a, I mean, a $40 salad, that's like, whew, that's a fancy salad. Uh, but, but I don't know whether this is a good deal. And I haven't heard of Green Chef. And so, am I likely to go and try it? Probably not. Right? If people don't know you and like you and trust you already, Ads tend not to work so great, right? This, this is one of the frustrating things about advertising. Uh, advertising is supposed to make you get known better. <laughs> yeah, right? So, I mean, one of the things that you could do with advertising, and people do this all the time, is they try and get what, better known through it, right? So you've never heard of this company before. We're going to do lots of advertising so that you do hear of us and know what we do and who we are, right? And you have some association. Sometimes that, sometimes that works, uh, not, not always. And, and, and advertising can be very, very expensive, right? So like if, for example, the Robot Turtles creators were to say, hey, let's do some t television advertising. Well, not always as expensive as, that, it, as expensive as those salads, though. Yeah, so. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> good, good point, Daisy. Um, <laughs> but, but like if... You know, if we were running the advertising for Robot Turtles and we were to say, oh, you know, how much would it cost to put, I don't know, the Robot Turtles game on a bunch of TV ads? The answer would be like usually hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Well, 
that's going to take all the money that we will ever make from robot turtles more than that and and sink it into this like we, we couldn't possibly afford it right so we, we're trying to look for things that are going to be less expensive and advertising usually works better when you are known and liked and trusted so i i stole this semi uh uh complicated graphic just to illustrate sort of how advertising on the internet tends to work, right? So, so take a look at advertiser one. They are paying $2 uh, every time someone clicks on their ad. And hopefully they're gonna make more than $2 every time someone clicks on their ad. If you're a very expensive salad company, <laughs> uh, hopefully you're selling your $40 salads to a lot of people and a lot of people who click on the ad buy the $40 salad. But if lots of people click on the ad and nobody buys the $40 salad, you are gonna be out a lot of money and have a lot of, I'm, I'm gonna guess, brown salads sitting around your fridge. Mm. Uh, versus, right? And, and this, this model works really well when you're well known and well liked and well trusted because you pay less the ad platforms, Google and Facebook, will show your ads more and they tend to be more effective, right? So Toyota does well with this stuff because lots of people know them and like them and trust them. So people will click their ads or, or they'll see their ad on TV and they'll go to a Toyota dealership or they'll go to the Toyota website, they'll buy the Toyota. And so it's, it's a good return. But if, you know, we make um, Daisy, Eli and Rand's new car.com, and then we try and advertise, we're gonna pay more like what Advertiser 4 does here, a very large amount. We're gonna uh, get a very low conversion rate, like very few people are gonna buy our new car because they don't know us yet, they don't, they don't trust us yet. That's like a big product, yeah. Yeah, like we're not, we're not sort of known to people and like taking a risk on a car is a big deal. Even taking a risk on a salad is a big deal. <laughs> you get, you, you better be, have some amazing salad for me to pay $4 and try your new salad. But, uh, and generally speaking, they'll, if we're not well known and well trusted, we pay the highest amount to advertise. So if you're known and loved, your ads tend to rock. And if you are not well known, you usually pay more and get less. So for new marketing, I, I don't love advertising as much. So I figured maybe it would be fun for us to try and do this together. We can pick uh, one of these um, you know, products or ideas or organizations or, or um, concepts and try and do the process of figuring out who are right people for the message. So what do you, what do you think? Do you wanna, uh, Daisy and Eli, maybe throw out who yes. are some people that you think might be right people for um, uh, reaching yeah. with, for D and D, yeah. All right, let's do D and D. Me, you, sure. But we need uh, a bigger group. People who don't have many friends, but they have like they're good at like looking out for people with traps and stuff. I guess. Okay. Okay. Uh, raise, raise around things. I guess. Um, it's yeah. a small group, but it's still a group. <laughs> How would we? How would we like define that group of people? Like, what would we? What would we say? I would say ten. I guess they would be people who are looking for something to do with their friends. Perfect. Like yes, exactly. I love it. People who are looking for something to do with their friends, they uh, absolutely should be introduced to to Dungeons and Dragons, right? So that might be a right group for our message. Perfect, Daisy. Let's let's use them. I, I would say for age. Probably uh, as young as 10 year olds, no younger otherwise they probably won't understand it. I remember trying to, re to read the rules on my seventh birthday because we got to start a set of the birthday present and I was like, what is that? And then three years later, I started reading the rules, read the entire well, rule book in the Fire Family. We've played d with some younger people. We have? Yeah, we have. Okay. Um, but anyway, like probably like 10 to 50 yeah. year olds, because like it's good to start so that you know how to play, and then you can play all the way up to like, I don't know, 100, 100, 100. maybe, 136? Yeah, 136, I think that's the maximum age range for D&D for &D listed on the box. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but this is- so, Next year, it's not good, no. 
So these are really good things to think about, right? So, so Daisy, you've identified like what is a characteristic of people who might be good uh, targets for D&D's message. And Eli, you're recognizing some of the demographic traits, right? So they, they have to be older than a certain age because under a certain age, it's, it's not going to work. Uh, if, if we were selling Toyota cars, you know, it's probably not to 14-year-olds or four-year-olds. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> well, me, can I have that car? Sure, honey. Can I drive it? No. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you 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 right. You want to pick people who can buy and who are interested in buying. All right. How would we get a deep understanding of people who have friends and they want to play with their friends, but they don't have something to do and are in the right age rate age range? Like, how would we how would we better understand that? surveys? Sur a survey, sure. Um, I feel like for D and D, if you were trying to get, you would do like um, kind of video Play games D &D. or adventure games, because most people who are looking for adventure would or like things to play as a group. Yeah, yeah. So you could absolutely do things like um, maybe go to places where people already play those games, or try and find. Um, find spots where they like a like a game store or you could go even to like an after school type of group right like lots of schools do it um you could go talk to families who might be interested yeah. how would we uh how would we come up with a good message right like a message that we want to send those people and figure out if that message resonates um i would say it's D, &D. get it <laughs> I mean, there you can definitely you can definitely go the very uh, direct, and that works okay if people know your product well, right? And they yeah, have like, an association with it. Subway commercials, they're like, it's fresh, it's delicious, just get it. Like some of those kind of uh, places are just very straightforward. Like, very straight. Uh, so okay. my favorite straightforward uh, marketing example. Did you ever <laughs> see the Muppets Take Manhattan? Yeah, I think. I think we like watched all the Muppet movies at some point. I just forgot like every single thing. They're them. freaky. They're a okay. little weird. I hate but... Muppets. <laughs> so, okay, all right. This is my favorite scene. My favorite scene from the Muppet movie, from uh, Muppets Take Manhattan, is, is Kermit the Frog loses his memory. Like he gets amnesia. I can't remember. He like gets hit on the head or something. No. Yeah. And so like he can't remember who he is. He doesn't remember any of his friends. So instead of hanging out with like Miss Piggy and Fonzie and all of them, like he go, he's walking around New York and he gets invited into this room and there's a bunch of marketers in there and they're trying to figure out how to sell soap. And, uh, and Kermit the Frog says, well. I feel like I remember that. Yeah, he's like, we're, we're, why don't we just tell the people what the soap does? They're like, well. I, I remember that my favorite, all the other frogs in the room, like their eyes just go huge. And they're like, just tell people what the product does. It's never been tried before. And anyway, this, <laughs> I, I think it's Ocean Breeze. Ocean Breeze soap will get you clean. And this is, this is, this is the gag. Uh, we'll find it. We'll find the, the video somewhere. I'll send it. Uh, all right. What might be what might be some places to go send the message of like Red. Dungeons and Dragons? It's a great fun way for people who love adventure to play with their friends. Like where would we where Red would we it. Go tell that? Uh, you you could social tell media. It, you could tell it to um, wow. Uh, I think YouTube. I think podcast. Everywhere else. I okay. Yeah, Daisy, I, go ahead. I believe, I'm not sure, I've heard that Roll20 does more than just D&D, and for people who are like, stuff that has more than D&D, like adventuring games, like, I don't, or like, you can play this game. For not you video this game games, game. really, because that's kind of different, but like a board game website, yeah. or like, perfect. Or like a map website, a make a map kind of thing, and then, like, I guess I'll, what are you going to do with these maps? Then. Why don't you use them for D&D? &D? Perfect. Yeah, so this is, a, this is a great way to do marketing, right? When, whenever something is attracting attention, 
um, whether it's you know uh, maps or here's a recipe website. Uh, well, if it, if you've got a great recipe and food website, maybe you should try this pasta. If you've got a great board game, you've got great maps. Maybe you should try D and D, right? Uh, so I think I think those are perfect examples. All right. And what would be what would be a way that we could experiment and see if this message was working? Like, how would we know if it was working or not? Play D and D. Yeah. We could like improve the product. Um, after somebody sees the map the and like, I guess it, on this imaginary website, there would be a place, there's probably this website and I can feel people yelling at me, yelling me the website name right now, or like any website name, there's probably a website that does this, but like you can post your map for D&D &D, uh -huh. and that, and that might help if you like watch people who usually did maps and then posted them on the D&D &D part. Yeah, so we would, right, you would try and see like, okay, a uh, hundred maps were posted and a thousand people visited them. How many of those people came over to our D&D &D website, right? So yeah. we might look at the percent of people who did that and maybe next time we could change the message, right? So instead of play D&D, &D, it's fun, we might say, um, are you and your friends seeking an amazing adventure together? Or, or do a... And have a really cheesy animation of like do, a paladin running around playing zombies. Or do one of those funny ads fun. that are like princesses and rainbows and stuff. But, yeah. but are you like... No. You, no, 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 no. But, uh, and then it goes... Princesses like, and rainbows and puppies. Eh, zombies I mean, and puppies. I mean, D&D has a lot of princesses yeah, I, yeah. and rainbows yeah. and puppies. Well, Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> but, and then it would be like, are you hardcore and have like the... D&D. &D. Do you yeah, like yeah, so you could, rainbows and puppies? So you could try well, you could, all these different kinds of messages, like, right? And, fighters, rainbows, and marketers do this all the time, right? They put up different messages in their ads. They put up different messages in their, uh, on their websites. They put up different messages on other people's websites. And then they try and see which one works best, right? So, it, you know, Eli, it could be the case that you have an idea and you're confident that it's going to work. And Daisy has an idea and she's confident it's going to work. And you're like, no way. There's no way that the puppies and rainbows and, and princesses is going to work. But if we test them, right, if we put both of them up, um, maybe alternating. So one appears on the website when one person visits, one appears on the website when the other person visits. And we do that a few hundred times, we can see what the data shows us, right? So if the data says, oh, more people clicked on the princesses one, then our assumptions have been invalidated and we have to change our mind, right? We have to come up with something better. Occasionally, probably once in a while, it would be really annoying because people were like, a bunch of people, if you were testing it, would be looking forward to D&D. And they're like, oh. oh, oh, I didn't know what the website was called. Now I'll sign up. So uh, this, is, this is another really good point, Daisy, about um, how to yeah. think about marketing right because if you if you pitch your product or your idea as being one thing but then when people get there it's another thing like for example right i you know i said oh well this you know i don't know about these salads whatever maybe you look at the salad and you're like gosh that's a beautiful salad i really want to try it and then you get it and it doesn't look like what was in the picture and it doesn't taste as good as you thought it did now you've had a negative experience. You're going to be less likely to buy from them in the future. You're going to be less likely to try it. So one of the things as marketers we have to do is do a good job of pitching the product in a way that it's, it's not going to create this like, cognitive dissonance, right? Essentially not create a bad experience for people when they actually try it. Like we don't want to sell people on D&D &D being something that it's not because then if they try it, they're going to be frustrated and they won't just be frustrated with the game. They'll be frustrated with us, right? Wherever they read about it, they won't trust us anymore. On the thing with puppies and rainbows and dragon and uh, dra dragons and zombies thing, it could just be that like one works that both work 50% and that could just because everybody wants to play D and D and they're just clicking on whatever D and D they find. That, this is true. Some, and sometimes I have done plenty of tests myself on my own websites where I tried different messaging that I thought was very different and it performs exactly the same. So you're totally right. Sometimes you don't get a performance improvement out of testing new messaging. 
Because they're just like, I, want to do this. I don't care what the advertisement is. I've or heard about like, it. And I it's don't want to cool. do this. So this you get a like, lot of people who really just don't want to do it. So like, yeah. Yeah. I don't like puppies and rainbows or dragons and zombies. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. So we are through with our lesson for today on Web Marketing 101. But if you have questions, of course, I am happy to take them. And for anybody watching at home uh, who has questions, you can also email me or send a tweet to me too. Or at Shapiro School on Twitter. Oh, nice. Hashtag, sorry, hashtag Shapiro School. Hashtag Shapiro School. Okay, well, yeah, so make sure to use that if you ask the question on Twitter. That's a good point. I think, um, is there any questions that you think viewers at home would like ask? Well, I thought you explained pretty much. Yeah, you did pretty explain well. it pretty well. Aww. Well, thanks. I'm thrilled to hear it. It was really fun uh, getting together with you two and, and learning more about web marketing together. And uh, hopefully, if you ever have things that you do in your future uh, that are entrepreneurial or that you launch things, you make things, you have ideas, uh, this will this will be a helpful framework. And uh, yeah, I think it was. Uh, hopefully, we'll get together sometime in the in the iDistrict again sometime soon. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, take oh, care, gang. Bye. Bye. Bye.